Hear Israel, Kurios, the Lord is our God. Kurios Heises, and the Lord is one. We all know what it is. It is the Shema, because in the Hebrew, uh, it begins Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. The Lord, Yahweh, notice right there, there's Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is Echad, is one. And then you go back to what we have here in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. The Os, here's Heis. Here's Kurios. If this predates Paul's entrance into the church, then that means from the start, you had the highest possible Christology. Because think about it. Think about what, what 1 Corinthians 8, 6 does. It takes the, the definitional, identifying, setting Israel apart text from Deuteronomy 6, 4. The Shema and opens it up and expands it. Who has the right to do that? Yeah, that's actually a good question. So for decades now, Trinitarian scholars have argued that Paul is somehow splitting, expanded the Shema in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. But I want you to think about what other Trinitarian scholars are saying about that proposition. For example, Trinitarian Robert Bowman in his book, Putting Jesus in His Place, makes an interesting observation about the language here that Paul is using. For example, when Paul says, all things are from God the Father, Bowman admits that it's true that the New Testament never says that all things are from the Greek preposition there, ek, the sun. And Bowman goes on to show you in his book this nice little chart that shows exactly that biblical fact that the language is specific when it comes to creation being from God. In other words, created by God, that is the Father. As you see there on the chart on the left, the Greek ek, translated as from, and the verses there in the middle, pertaining to God the Father, and look at the chart on the right under the Lord Jesus the Son, zero. No verses. So that's something you need to think about. If the New Testament never says that creation, Genesis, is never from the Son, how can he possibly be God, the Creator? And the rest of this chart notes the language where all things are always said to be through or in the sun. In other words, the sun is always the agent, the means of creation. Now, what that means, does it mean that the sun was literally there before his virgin birth? That's another topic, the topic known as pre-existence. That's beside this point that I'm trying to make here. Also, let me show you th this interesting paper that was published back in 2013 by Dr. James F. McGrath from Butler University. But in this paper, you will find some interesting counter arguments by yet another Trinitarian scholar here, Dr. McGrath. For example, on page seven, he says in part, one question we need to ask ourselves is whether Paul is likely to have made his most substantial points about the nature of Jesus by quoting or alluding to key texts that were slogans of Jewish monotheism, like the Shema while at the same time supposedly making subtle but significant additions or insertions so as to, in the words of N.T. Wright, another Trinitarian scholar, split the Shema, or in the terminology of Richard Bauckham, yet another Trinitarian scholar, quote, include Jesus within the divine identity. So here Dr. McGrath himself, a Trinitarian, is actually trying to understand these texts in a different light, in the light of what they actually mean when you read them, as opposed to what so many Trinitarian scholars are hearing with a sort of biased Trinitarian mindset. And then on page 16, he goes on to say, in our time, many of us have heard the Shema far less frequently than the Nicene Creed. This cannot but be an influence even on scholarly interpreters who make an effort to avoid reading our assumptions 
and contemporary influences into the texts we study. There is no doubt that it is possible to read Paul's affirmations in the framework of, of a faith tradition that upholds the creeds, as has been done now for more than a millennium and a half. But historical study seeks to hear Paul's voice, not as an expression of a Nicene orthodoxy that had not been defined as such in his time, but as a specific voice of his own time in an earlier period. Paul's journey may well have been on the same road that eventually led to Nicaea and Chalcedon, but the debates and conflicts of the intervening centuries suggest that the road from Paul to Nicaea was often uphill and frequently rocky and by no means an instance of a causal linear stroll through flat, familiar terrain. So that's a nice analogy basically telling us that Really, we should question this theology and Christology expressed by Paul in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, and what eventually led to questions about the one God of Israel. How many was God, really? Which started this whole Trinitarian debate that continues to this day, by the way. It was not settled in 325 AD. The fact is, as we say, context is king when it comes to reading the New Testament, because for Paul, God is the Father 40 plus times. Paul talks about, for example, our one God and Father of the Lord Messiah. In Romans 1, Romans 6, Romans 8, he calls the one God Abba Father. And in the passage in question here, 1 Corinthians chapters 1, 8, and 15, the one God is always defined as the Father. Same with 2 Corinthians 1, chapter 6 and 11, and really the rest of the New Testament writers. It's very rare that the title God is applied to Jesus, but overwhelmingly the title God, the word God, is always applied to his father, who is known in the Old Testament as Yahweh or Jehovah. So I hope that helps in your reading of scripture. I hope that helps to see that Paul here is really not expanding anything. He's not splitting the Jewish Christian statement of faith known as the Shema. For Paul and for the rest of the New Testament writers, Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of the one God who is called the Father. He is the Lord Christ. He's not the Lord God, never. <laughs>